Complete Works of Swami Vivekananda, by Swami Vivekananda. Volume 2, Practical Vedantu and Other Lectures. A Study of the Sankhya Philosophy. Prakriti is called by the Sankhya philosophers indiscreet, and defined as the perfect balance of the materials in it, and it naturally follows that in perfect balance there cannot be any motion. In the primal state before any manifestation, when there was no motion but perfect balance, this prakriti was indestructible, because decomposition or death comes from instability or change. Again, according to the Sankhya, atoms are not the primal state. This universe does not come out of atoms, they may be the secondary or the tertiary state. The primordial material may form into atoms and become grosser and bigger things, and as far as modern investigations go, they rather point towards the same conclusion. For instance, in the modern theory of ether, if you say ether is atomic, it will not solve anything. To make it clearer, say that air is composed of atoms, and we know that ether is everywhere, interpenetrating, omnipresent, and that these air atoms are floating, as it were, in ether. If ether again be composed of atoms, there will still be spaces between every two atoms of ether. What fills up these? If you suppose that there is another ether still finer which does this, there will again be other spaces between the atoms of that finer ether which require filling up, and so it will be regressus ad infinitum. What the Sankhya philosophers call the cause leading to nothing so the atomic theory cannot be final. According to Sankhya, nature is omnipresent, one omnipresent mass of nature, in which are the causes of everything that exists. What is meant by cause? Cause is the fine state of the manifested state, the unmanifested state of that which becomes manifested. What do you mean by destruction? It is reverting to the cause if you have a piece of pottery and give it a blow, it is destroyed. What is meant by this is that the effects go back to their own nature, the materials out of which the pottery was created go back into their original state. Beyond this idea of destruction, any idea such as annihilation is on the face of it absurd. According to modern physical science, it can be demonstrated that all destruction means that which Kepler said ages ago, simply reverting to the cause. Going back to the finer form is all that is meant by destruction. You know how it can be demonstrated in a laboratory that matter is indestructible. At this present stage of our knowledge, if any man stands up and says that matter or this soul becomes annihilated, he is only making himself ridiculous. It is only uneducated silly people who would advance such a proposition, and it is curious that modern knowledge coincides with what those old philosophers taught. It must be so, and that is the proof of truth. They proceeded in their inquiry, taking up mind as the basis, they analyzed the mental part of this universe and came to certain conclusions, which we, analyzing the physical part, must come to, for they both must lead to the same center. You must remember that the first manifestation of this prakriti in the cosmos is what the Sankhya calls Mahat. We may call it intelligence, the great principle, its literal meaning. The first change in prakriti is this intelligence, I would not translate it by self-consciousness, because that would be wrong. Consciousness is only a part of this intelligence. Mahat is universal. It covers all the grounds of subconsciousness consciousness, and superconsciousness, so any one state of consciousness, as applied to this Mahat, would not be sufficient. In nature, for instance, you note certain changes going on before your eyes which you see and understand, but there are other changes, so much finer, that no human perception can catch them. They are from the same cause, the same Mahat is making these changes. Out of Mahat comes universal egoism. These are all substance. There is no difference between matter and mind, except in degree. The substance is the same in finer or grosser form, one changes into the other, and this exactly coincides with the conclusions of modern physiological research. By believing in the teaching that the mind is not separate from the brain, you will be saved from much fighting and struggling. Egoism again changes into two varieties. In one variety it changes into the organs. 
Organs are of two kinds, organs of sensation and organs of reaction. They are not the eyes or the ears, but back of those are what you call brain centers, and nerve centers, and so on. This egoism, this matter or substance, becomes changed, and out of this material are manufactured these centers. Of the same substance is manufactured the other variety, the tanmatras, fine particles of matter, which strike our organs of perception and bring about sensations. You cannot perceive them but only know they are there. Out of the tanmatras is manufactured the gross matter, earth, water, and all the things that we see and feel. I want to impress this on your mind. It is very, hard to grasp it, because in western countries the ideas are so queer about mind and matter. It is hard to get those impressions out of our brains. I myself had a tremendous difficulty, being educated in western philosophy in my boyhood. These are all cosmic things. Think of this universal extension of matter, unbroken, one substance, undifferentiated, which is the first state of everything, and which begins to change in the same way as milk becomes curd. This first change is called Mahat. The substance Mahat changes into the grosser matter called egoism. The third change is manifested as universal sense organs, and universal fine particles, and these last again combine and become this gross universe which with eyes, nose, and ears, we see, smell, and hear. This is the cosmic plan according to the Sankhya, and what is in the cosmos must also be microcosmic. Take an individual man. He has first a part of undifferentiated nature in him, and that material nature in him becomes changed into this Mahat, a small particle of this universal intelligence, and this particle of universal intelligence in him becomes changed into egoism, and then into the sense organs and the fine particles of matter which combine and manufacture his body. I want this to be clear because it is the stepping stone to Sankhya, and it is absolutely necessary for you to understand it, because this is the basis of the philosophy of the whole world. There is no philosophy in the world that is not indebted to Kapila. Pythagoras came to India and studied this philosophy, and that was the beginning of the philosophy of the Greeks. Later, it formed the Alexandrian school, and still later, the Gnostic. It became divided into two. One part went to Europe and Alexandria, and the other remained in India, and out of this, the system of Vyasa was developed. The Sankhya philosophy of Kapila was the first rational system that the world ever saw. Every metaphysician in the world must pay homage to him. I want to impress on your mind that we are bound to listen to him as the great father of philosophy. This wonderful man, the most ancient of philosophers, is mentioned even in the Shruti, O Lord, Thou who produced the sage Kapila in the beginning. How wonderful his perceptions were, and if there is ant proof required of the extraordinary power of the perception of yogis, such men are the proof. They had no microscopes or telescopes. Yet how fine their perception was, how perfect and wonderful their analysis of things. I will here point out the difference between Schopenhauer and the Indian philosophy. Schopenhauer says that desire, or will, is the cause of everything. It is the will to exist that make us manifest, but we deny this. The will is identical with the motor nerves. When I see an object there is no will, when its sensations are carried to the brain, there comes the reaction, which says do this, or do not do this and this state of the ego substance is what is called will. There cannot be a single particle of will which is not a reaction. So many things precede will. It is only a manufactured something out of the ego, and the ego is a manufacture of something still higher, the intelligence, and that again is a modification of the indiscreet nature. That was the Buddhistic idea, that whatever we see is the will. It is psychologically entirely wrong because will can only be identified with the motor nerves. If you take out the motor nerves, a man has no will whatever. This fact, as is perhaps well known to you, has been found out after a long series of experiments made with the lower animals. We will take up this question. 
It is very important to understand this question of Mahat in man, the great principle, the intelligence. This intelligence itself is modified into what we call egoism, and this intelligence is the cause of all the powers in the body. It covers the whole ground, subconsciousness, consciousness, and superconsciousness. What are these three states? The subconscious state we find in animals, which we call instinct. This is almost infallible, but very limited. Instinct rarely fails. An animal almost instinctively knows a poisonous herb from an edible one, but its instinct is very limited. As soon as something new comes, it is blind. It works like a machine. Then comes a higher state of knowledge which is fallible and makes mistakes often, but has a larger scope, although it is slow, and this you call reason. It is much larger than instinct, but instinct is surer than reason. There are more chances of mistakes in reasoning than in instinct. There is a still higher state of the mind, the superconscious, which belongs only to yogis, to men who have cultivated it. This is infallible and much more unlimited in its scope than reason. This is the highest state. So we must remember, this Mahat is the real cause of all that is here, that which manifests itself in various ways, covers the whole ground of subconscious, conscious, and superconscious, the three states in which knowledge exists. Now comes a delicate question which is being always asked, if a perfect God created the universe, why is there imperfection in it? What we call the universe is what we see, and that is only this little plane of consciousness and reason, beyond that we do not see at all. Now the very question is an impossible one. If I take only a small portion out of a mass of something and look at it, it seems to be inharmonious. Naturally, the universe is inharmonious because we make it so. How? What is reason? What is knowledge? Knowledge is finding the association about things. You go into the street and see a man and say, I know this is a man, because you remember the impressions on your mind, the marks on the chitter. You have seen many men, and each one has made an impression on your mind, and as you see this man, you refer this to your store and see many similar pictures there, and when you see them, you are satisfied, and you put this new one with the rest. When a new impression comes and it has associations in your mind, you are satisfied, and this state of association is called knowledge. Knowledge is, therefore, pigeonholing one experience with the already existing fund of experience, and this is one of the great proofs of the fact that you cannot have any knowledge until you have already a fund in existence. If you are without experience, as some European philosophers think, and that your mind is a tabula rasa to begin with, you cannot get any knowledge, because the very fact of knowledge is the recognition of the new by means of associations already existing in the mind. There must be a store at hand to which to refer a new impression. Suppose a child is born into this world without such a fund, it would be impossible for him ever to get any knowledge. Therefore, the child must have been previously in a state in which he had a fund, and so knowledge is eternally increasing. Slow me a way of getting round this argument. It is a mathematical fact. Some Western schools of philosophy also hold that there cannot be any knowledge without a fund of past knowledge. They have framed the idea that the child is born with knowledge. These Western philosophers say that the impressions with which the child comes into the world are not due to the child's past, but to the experiences of his forefathers, it is only hereditary transmission. Soon they will find out that this idea is all wrong, some German philosophers are now giving hard blows to these heredity ideas. Heredity is very good, but incomplete, it only explains the physical side. How do you explain the environments influencing us? Many causes produce one effect. Environment is one of the modifying effects. We make our own environment, as our past is so we find the present environment. A drunken man naturally gravitates to the lowest slums of the city. You understand what is meant by knowledge. Knowledge is pigeonholing a new impression with old ones, recognizing a new impression. What is meant by recognition? 
finding associations with similar impressions that one already has. Nothing further is meant by knowledge. If that is the case, if knowledge means finding the associations, then it must be that to know anything we have to set the whole series of its similars. Is it not so? Suppose you take a pebble, to find the association, you have to see the whole series of pebbles similes to it. But with our perception of the universe as a whole we cannot do that, because in the pigeonhole of our mind there is only one single record of the perception, we have no other perception of the same nature or class, we cannot compare it with any other. We cannot refer it to its associations. This bit of the universe, cut off by our consciousness, is a startling new thing, because we have not been able to find its associations. Therefore, we are struggling with it, and thinking it horrible, wicked, and bad, we may sometimes think it is good, but we always think it is imperfect. It is only when we find its associations that the universe can be known. We shall recognize it when we go beyond the universe and consciousness, and then the universe will stand explained. Until we can do that, all the knocking of our heads against a wall will never explain the universe, because knowledge is the finding of similars, and this conscious plane only gives us one single perception of it. So with our idea of God. All that we see of God is only a part just as we see only one portion of the universe, and all the rest is beyond human cognition. I, the universal, so great am I that even this universe is but a part of me. That is why we see God, as imperfect, and do not understand him. The only way to understand him and the universe is to go beyond reason, beyond consciousness. When thou goest beyond the heard and the hearing, the thought and the thinking, then alone wilt thou come to truth. Go thou beyond the scriptures, because they teach only up to nature, up to the three qualities. When we go beyond them, we find the harmony, and not before. The microcosm and the macrocosm are built on exactly the same plan, and in the microcosm we know only one part, the middle part. We know neither the subconscious, nor the superconscious. We know the conscious only. If a man stands up and says, I am a sinner, he makes an untrue statement because he does not know himself. He is the most ignorant of men, of himself he knows only one part, because his knowledge covers only a part of the ground he is on. So with this universe, it is possible to know only a part of it with the reason, not the whole of it, for the subconscious, the conscious and the superconscious, the individual Mahat and the universal Mahat, and all the subsequent modifications, constitute the universe. What makes nature, Prakriti, change? We see so far that everything, all Prakriti, is Jada, insentient. It is all compound and insentient. Wherever there is law, it is proof that the region of its play is insentient. Mind, intelligence, will, and everything else is insentient. But they are all reflecting the sentiency, the chit of some being who is beyond all this, whom the Sakya philosophers call Purashaw. The Purashaw is the unwitting cause of all the changes in the universe. That is to say, this Purashaw, taking him in the universal sense, is the god of the universe. It is said that the will of the Lord created the universe. It is very good as a common expression, but we see it cannot be true. How could it be will? Will is the third or fourth manifestation in nature. Many things exist before it, and what created them? Will is a compound, and everything that is a compound is a product of nature. Will, therefore, could not create nature. So, to say that the will of the Lord created the universe is meaningless. Our will only covers a little portion of self-consciousness and moves our brain. It is not will that is working your body or that is working the universe. This body is being moved by a power of which will is only a manifestation in one part. Likewise in the universe there is will, but that is only one part of the universe. The whole of the universe is not guided by will, that is why we cannot explain it by the will theory. Suppose I take it for granted that it is will moving the body, then, when I find I cannot work it at will, I begin to fret and fume. It is my fault, because I had no right to take the will theory for granted. 
In the same way, if I take the universe and think it is will that moves it and find things which do not coincide, it is my fault. So the Purushaw is not will. Neither can it be intelligence, because intelligence itself is a compound. There cannot be any intelligence without some sort of matter corresponding to the brain. Wherever there is intelligence, there must be something akin to that matter which we call brain which becomes lumped together into a particular form and serves the purpose of the brain. Wherever there is intelligence, there must be that matter in some form or other. But intelligence itself is a compound. What then is this Purushaw? It is neither intelligence nor will, but it is the cause of all these. It is its presence that sets them all going and combining. It does not mix with nature, it is not intelligence, or Mahat, but the self, the pure, is Purushaw. I am the witness, and through my witnessing, nature is producing, all that is sentient and all that is insentient. What is this sentiency in nature? We find intelligence is this sentiency which is called Chit. The basis of sentiency is in the Purushaw, it is the nature of Purushaw. It is that which cannot be explained but which is the cause of all that we call knowledge. Purushaw is not consciousness, because consciousness is a compound, but whatever is light and good in consciousness belongs to Purushaw. Purushaw is not conscious, but whatever is light in intelligence belongs to Purushaw. Sentiency is in the Purushaw, but the Purushaw is not intelligent, not knowing. The chit in the Purushaw plus Prakriti is what we see around us. Whatever is pleasure and happiness and light in the universe belongs to Purushaw, but it is a compound, because it is Purushaw plus Prakriti. Wherever there is any happiness, wherever there is any bliss, there is a spark of that immortality which is God. Purushaw is there, great attraction of the universe, though untouched by and unconnected with the universe, yet it attracts the whole universe. You see a man going after gold, because behind it is a spark of the purush or though mixed up with a good deal of dirt. When a man loves his children or a woman her husband, what is the attracting power? A spark of purush or behind them. It is there, only mixed up with dirt. Nothing else can attract. In this world of insentiency the purush or alone is sentient. This is the purush or of the Sankhya. As such, it necessarily follows that the Purushaw must be omnipresent. That which is not omnipresent must be limited. All limitations are caused, that which is caused must have a beginning and end. If the Purushaw is limited, it will die, will not be free, will not be final, but must have some cause. Therefore it is omnipresent. According to Kepler, there are many Purushas, not one but an infinite number of them, you and I have each of us one, and so has everyone else, an infinite number of circles, each one infinite, running through this universe. The Purushaw is neither mind nor matter, the reflex from it is all that we know. We are sure if it is omnipresent it has neither death nor birth. Nature is casting her shadow upon it, the shadow of birth and death, but it is by its nature pure. So far we have found the philosophy of the Sankhya wonderful. Next we shall take up the proofs against it. So far the analysis is perfect, the psychology incontrovertible. We find by the division of the senses into organs and instruments that they are not simple, but compound, by dividing egoism into sense and matter, we find that this is also material and that Mahat is also a state of matter, and finally we find the Purushaw. So far there is no objection. But if we ask the Sankhya the question, who created nature? The Sankhya says that the Purushaw and the Prakriti are uncreate and omnipresent, and that of this Purushaw there is an infinite number. We shall have to controvert these propositions, and find a better solution, and by so doing we shall come to Advaitism. Our first objection is, how can there be these two infinites? Then our argument will be that the Sankhya is not a perfect generalization, and that we have not found in it a perfect solution. And then we shall see how the Vedantists grow part of all these difficulties and reach a perfect solution, and yet all the glory really belongs to the Sankhya. It is very easy to give a finishing touch to a building when it is constructed, 